it's now time to join Chief herself, Oji, Ojinika, Jinix, Okwe, with stories trending around the world. Action, action. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, Rufai. Dr. Amati, we miss you. Or we do. Oh, People yeah. have been complaining oh, about this chief, uh, Rufai. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. No, no, no. no. <laughs> they, they have to give you the chief as a title. What is it? Okay, today is the last day of the campaign. Wait. How about that? <laughs> no, okay, yes. Today is the last day of the campaign. Okay. But you see, you call things you want to come to life. Yes. Just like Rich. I said, something you don't. But it's agreeing. All right. Me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Ayo. How are you this morning? Good. Perfect. Thank Did you spot Good morning, Kayo Day. Yeah. As always, yeah. this is a violent show. I mean, right? <laughs> well, all right. Well, all right. Good morning to you, viewers. Here are some of the stories that are trending across the globe. In the United States, President Joe Biden on Thursday stumbled on stage at the Falcon Stadium in Colorado after handing out diplomas to graduates of the U.S. Air Force Academy. The 80-year-old president, who is running for re-election, stumbled as he turned to walk across the stage to his seat. He was then helped up by an Air Force officer and two members of his U.S. Secret Service detail. In Jordan, thousands celebrated on the streets in downtown Amman as heir to the throne of one of the oldest monarchies in the Middle East and a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, Crown Prince Al Hussein bin Abdullah II, tied the knot on Thursday with aristocratic Saudi architect Rajwa Al Saif. The wedding was attended by royals from Europe, including Britain's Prince of Wales, William and Kate Middleton, and the United States First Lady, Joe Biden. The bride and groom are set to become a power couple in the Middle East, forging a new bond between Jordan and Saudi Arabia. In Nigeria, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu on Thursday met with service chiefs for the first time since his assumption of office, demanding security agencies strengthen their coordination and not work at cross purposes. The National Security Advisor, Babagana Mungono, while addressing State House correspondents, said the president mandated the security agencies to develop a blueprint to deal with crude oil theft, among other issues. In Zimbabwe, the parliament voted on Thursday in favor of a controversial bill to punish citizens for unpatriotic acts, including imposing heavy fines or even the death penalty. The Patriot Clause of the Criminal Law Act targets those who harm the national interest of Zimbabwe. It includes any citizen who meets a representative of a foreign country with the aim of encouraging sanctions against Zimbabwe or overthrowing the government. Critics have called it a dark day for democracy, saying the legislation is unconstitutional as it would violate freedom of association and the right to free speech. California. Finally, on our entertainment, the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce confirmed on Wednesday that renowned hip-hop star Tupac Shakur will be honored with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. 26 years after his death, Tupac released his debut album in 1991 and went on to enjoy chart successes with hits including California Love, All Eyes on Me, and Changes. He died on September 13, 1996, at the age of 25, after he was shot four times in Las Vegas. The hip-hop star will be honored posthumously with a ceremony on the prestigious Los Angeles walkway on June 7, 2023. You have to show Rufai. Rufai yeah. has been dancing the whole hey, time. Yeah, I, I don't even know why it took 26 <laughs> years. I, I mean, how unfair is that? Yeah, I mean, but it's great. Legend. Fantastic. We'll Maybe be here on a Friday Rest talking about two packs, son of a Fanny Shako. <laughs> well, I can't wait to go and uh, see his star very soon, hopefully, yeah. when I get back to America. Thank go you, ahead, Oji. Quickly. Real quickly, concerning that Zimbabwe story, let's yes. be careful. 
because it's a deliberate attempt to stifle free speech, saying people are unpatriotic. Yeah. And I feel it's connected to what happened recently when Al Jazeera released a story on the gold dealings and the gold theft in Zimbabwe. Mm. You know, every Zimbabwe media was shot from taking that story. In fact, journalists that carried that story, they were hounded. So if you pass a law like this, that it is unpatriotic to say anything against the leader, you are stifling free speech. Other country where that is done is the repressive La Majesté laws in Thailand, where you are said you don't speak anything ill of the monarchy. Yeah. Well, all right. Let's continue on what's trending. Few queues that were witnessed across the country have begun to disappear barely 24 hours after the Nigerian National Petroleum Company adjusted the pump price of petrol by nearly 200%. Some Nigerians who cannot afford to purchase fuel at the new rate have had to abandon their vehicles to opt for other means of transportation in the federal capital territory, Abuja. Our reporter spoke to some residents big sad. Yesterday I almost shed tears. I used to fill this tank with uh, 14,000 Naira. But now you times it times three. You understand? 14 into three places. It's a very big amount of money. I was able to buy 8,500 yesterday, just 15 liter. I live in Jukwe. Just for me to go to Jukwe and come back, the, the whole thing was gone. Honestly, it's, I mean, it's something that you know, I mean, how will average earning individuals who drive a car, how will they survive? I mean, you have to spend at least 40, 45K every time you have to fill up your, your tank, you know. So how much is the salary? How much are you earning that you have to spend like 40, 45,000 naira to fill up your tank? And that is the point. How much are we earning to spend all that money? I mean, we have to talk about these, uh, whether it's called palliatives or what have you. But, you know, people are, you know, coming up with new measures to try to get to work. Either you're doing uh, shared rides, or, yeah. you know, carpool or, 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 or whatnot. But, you know, I saw a picture of a member of the Adamawa State House of uh, Assembly, uh, Haruna Gillian Tikiri who has opted for an electric bicycle instead of a car due to the high cost of fuel in the country. There's the photo right there, Rufai. I mean, the lawmaker is, is said to also be the chief whip of the State House of Assembly as well. I mean, I mean this, this is what we should be seeing, hopefully, in the future if we can. But, but the point is, he has electricity, correct? I mean, if you're going to get an electric exactly. bicycle, how do we you also... Forget, you're going to buy petrol <laughs> exactly, to put a generator to, put in to charge the plenty, electric vehicle. Plenty, plenty, plenty ways. Well, in the meantime, the group managing director of Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation Limited, Mele Kiari, while filled in questions from journalists at the end of the closed-door meeting with members of the National Working Committee of the All Progressives Congress on Thursday, revealed that President Bola Ahmed Tinubu has directed that some palliatives be put in place to cushion the effect of the subsidy removal on Nigerians. We talked about this again yesterday, Rufai more on palliatives. But let me just take some re um, reactions uh, from social media users. Actually, this is from uh, Omoyele Showere. He wrote, workers' minimum wage is 30K per month. Tinubu just stumbled a few times at his inauguration. And the only thing he could say was fuel subsidy is gone. He didn't say next. Minimum wage is now 250K. And now those who claimed this is good for Nigeria are stranded at home, unable to pay their way to work. Those who said an increase in minimum wage would lead to inflation are not saying a 300% increase in fuel price will kill everyone, even the middle class, if there exist any. They don't care about you. Well, he's always been against subsidy removal, Moela Shawara. Let me take Daniel Buala's tweet. He wrote, removal of fuel subsidy is the greatest good our nation needs. But if cushioning effect is not made available first, before the removal, it will place the masses on that heavy and unbearable burden. Secondly, if there is no well-defined and workable reinvestment plan in transport, education, healthcare, and infrastructure, which naturally benefit the poor, SMEs, drivers, and middle class, who are the engine of our economy? Then the whole thing will become another scam from one racketeer to another. Well, in the meantime, the president of the Petroleum and Natural Gas Senior Staff Association of Nigeria, Festus Osifo, was on our nightly news program, Newsnight, on Thursday. He spoke about why the federal government 
has failed to remove subsidies over the years. Different government, they subsidize different products. So for us, we don't have problem if government uh, wants to subsidize a product for its citizens. Uh, but the excuse that they have given over the years are the fact that when they bring in this product, that there are leakages that across the borders, that most of these products are smuggled out as a result of arbitrage. Mm -hmm. uh, they have put this forward. But we told them, that is why you are government. The function of, go of government, I mean, government is not a, a tea party. Government is a call to duty. So you must, you, you campaigned and you told the people that you want to protect them and you want to make the economy grow. So if you do that, at the end of the day, you should go and protect your borders. These were part of the conversations labor have had over the years, that you cannot transfer your inefficiency uh, to the citizens or to the masses. All right, Rufai, over to you quickly. I mean, I'm very, I feel very sad for the people that can't go to work that are stuck in all of this. And my heart goes out to everybody out there. I got a very damning message this morning. Somebody from Benin. I, I showed you that message. Yes, and it was very sad. It said since this happened, the child has not been able to go to school. The truth has to be told. This is the ripple effect of what we're saying. And the problem is the fact that because of the lack of planning, we did not put forward the palliatives. And what are the palliatives? The palliatives could be in terms of reducing transportation costs. The palliatives could be in terms of ensuring that people get to work on time. So I'll give you some quick palliatives. At this point in time with this, we could start with the Lagos state government. They have a lot of BRT buses. I think the Lagos state is about the only state that where you have still a level of control as regards state transportation. The Lagos State Government, if they can make some roads on BRT buses 100 Naira or 200 Naira now from the 500 or thereabout, it will go a long way. The other palliative they can put in place now is those electric buses, as much as possible, put them in. The third threshold of palliatives is how we can ensure, and I don't know how they're going to do it, how we can ensure that price of basic staple commodity reduces. I don't know how we can do it, but we'll have to think through that. You know why I'm saying that? The last time we tried price control in the 80s, where we had essential commodities, it backfired because it led to another form of racketeering. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't know how we're going to go about that. But you need to set those palliative in place to be able to reduce the burden on people. But you see, all of this is also difficult because we are a very largely informal country. And government has not done a lot at capturing the informal sector. So take, for instance, Angola pulled out sub subsidy, a little subsidy. Normally, their open market price is about 553 Kwanzaa. Mm -hmm. The subsidy they pull out now increased the price from 160 to 300 Kwanzaa. But the ameliorating effect they are putting now is they are still subsidizing for taxi drivers and for fishermen. Yeah. So when are we going to put in the palliative? But the problem I have with us is the fact that we have not even thought of the palliative. We're just saying palliative. What are the palliatives as yes. we speak? What is the framework? And that is a very important question. So there's question. nothing on ground. And that's why you're seeing all of this effect on the lives of the people. Is the government going to at least provide properly school buses? Right. You know, for children to be able to go to school and things like that. So they need to come out. And it shows when you don't plan for something, this is what you get. And that's why people are suffering this way. Yeah, I also wanted to touch on um, Pengerson boss, where he talked about the control of the land border. But I thought it was quite instructive that President yeah. Tinubu met with security um, chiefs and talked about, you know, securing the land. But I think that's also a very good step that he is taking there. Yeah. But you're talking about palliatives. Earlier, I believe that I also say some stuff at Chike will be talk about, you know, whether it's food stamps or yeah. SNAP benefits, it's mm -hmm. the same thing. But how are those funded? They are funded by the United States Department of Agriculture and federal taxpayers. That's another way. I mean, if they have to fund it through that, that's another way to look at our Ministry of Agriculture, are they producing enough? Are we going to be able to make those cards for those palliatives? We also spoke about the $800 million that was um, borrowed yeah. from the previous administration. We need to also see that put in place. But there's also the, you know, cutting down of governance. I mean, we can save a lot from that yeah, as well to try to um, get those uh, 
palliatives in place as well for the poorest of the poor, which is the most important thing. Ayo, really quickly. Right, so there, there are a number of savings that can help to cushion the effect, and you've talked about one, which is cost in governance, mm -hmm. and I think Nigerians want to see that happen immediately. Absolutely. We want to see that happen immediately, and let's see how much money we're able to save to fund these palliatives, and we've mentioned the others. But, you know, the first time palliatives became a very popular word, mm -hmm. Oji, was during COVID. Yes. And COVID happened on us. So we didn't have time to plan, not just Nigeria, but across the world. So we reacted or responded to the needs of people based on a daily, you know, we kept com coming up with policies. Um, and then we had the car COVID, the private sector came on board. The difference between COVID and fuel subsidy removal is that fuel subsidy removal should not have happened on us immediately. It's something that could have been planned. It's something that could have been made, a provision could have been made for it, which I am hoping this present administration has done. Now, going back, I'll come back to this conversation. I just wanted to set that tone in terms of the fact that it shouldn't, we should, palliatives should have been something that we plan for ahead of time and we already know where, which funding is going to go to what. But now we're here, everyone is an analyst now, we're giving recommendations yeah. to the government. Everyone should, you know, we are a general th think tank. Yeah. But going Nigerians. back to, yeah, Nigerian think tank. Nigerians. But going back to the picture of the, uh, of the house, of yes. Adama State, um, um, who was riding an electric bicycle. Yes. How much is an electric bicycle, OJ? Actually, um, the cost of a new one is between 200,000 and 500,000. Yeah, How many people can, can afford, afford it? it? The cost of a of, of a used one is between 80,000 naira and 300,000 naira. That's on one hand. People cannot afford it. Absolutely. Simple. The second part is safety concerns. Look at him without a um, <laughs> helmet. <laughs> well, I don't know if he was actually riding or No, I'm even using him as an example. I'm <laughs> just saying, saying helmets, that, furthermore, that if we're going to have alternative <laughs> sources of transportation, <laughs> there are other regulations and guidelines that will come into place. Yes. Have we planned for that? Absolutely. Have we prepared for that? What's the fallout of people looking for other options? There are safety concerns around even carpooling. They are, we have issues around kidnapping. Have we thought about the security um, effect or impact of these things? There, there are so many conversations that we should have had a number of people come together to make sufficient plans for this. But here we are. The first one, and, and then I'll move on, is recommendations in terms of what can we do. This is where empowering the local government would be excellent because they are the ones most in touch with the people in their community. Get people, and hopefully this will be better managed than we had the car COVID issue or COVID issue where um, palliatives were missing. Absolutely. Let the most vulnerable go to schools, get the children eating. And I love the idea of the school buses funded by government. Absolutely. Excellent. But so many things need to be considered. I love that. All right, we'll take another story. Grammy-nominated Afrobeat singer Sheung Kuti, who made headlines last month after he was filmed assaulting a police officer on the Third Mainland Bridge, has accused supporters of Peter Obi, popularly known as Obedience, of trying to set him up following his arrest by the Nigerian police. The controversial singer made the allegations in a video posted on Instagram. Let's take a look before we come back for a discussion. Let me now tell you, let me dispel the, the rumors from uh, the fake Twitter journalist there. Which uh, is that would they have really recorded that day? Do, 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 Thank God for the ASS. They don't say ancestral secret service is always working. Even if I said they did it with me, 24 hours washing, guarding, making sure most to you know the person will go say we must no bite her. When I don't hear say person go say before mosquito no bite her. Now maybe that all these fake journalists can't back up what they are saying, can't back up what they are doing because they know what they're behind. The nonsense where they spew as facts. Even when they talk truth, they are lying. Because the truth gets agenda. They are not saying it for the sake of people knowing. They are saying it so that they can gain something from somewhere that is sinister. Even when they do right, it is wrong. Really? Sharon Kuti? Even when journalists do right, we are wrong. I, I, I mean, there are too many things here. I want Kayode to quickly speak before I come to you, Rufai, because I know you have a comment. I wish you wouldn't ask me to talk about Sheung because yes. <laughs> you're a fan. <laughs> no, Sheung is my younger brother. But he you is have my him, brother. so you have to. Uh, Sheung is well, my what brother. Do you make of what I he's, love this young man. Statement. I love his family. I love everyone around him. But 
I will be honest and truth has to be told. Sheung, I will say to you very clearly, you have no right to come out and say anything about John List or anybody else when you've just gone through a phase where what you did was obviously wrong, irrespective of anything that anybody can say. You do not smack or lay your hand on any human being, be that person, be a policeman, or even just a normal person on the street. You don't lay your hands on it. And when you have that situation, show, please, your big brother is talking to you here. If you have done that, you have to show some remorse and do not go out and begin to criticize anyone. At least give some breathing space, show, my dear brother. Give some breathing space. Let this at least be watered away, washed away, flushed away for a season. Once that is done, then you can come out and be gone blazing. You have amazing intelligence and I expect that you will use it and show leadership amongst you because there are a lot of young people Absolutely. that listen to show every word he speaks. They believe him and if this is the leadership he's offering young people, then we're in serious trouble for the future. Discrediting journalists, I mean, Rufai. You know, I feel very sad that he's saying all of this. Owing to the fact that the case is still in court, does he, does he realize that? He was just released on bail. The case is still in court. I'm also sure, does he realize that when the case was on, part of the things they used against him was also what he said on an Instagram live like this. Mm -hmm. That he hates police officers. If a comment was made about you, you still have a case in court. It's best you fight your case to a logical conclusion before all of this. Because a lot was said. And you see, the only right thing to do, as the matter is still on, is to keep quiet. Because you see, and this same journalist he's talking about, that even when journalists like, these were the same journalists that spoke up for him. Yes. When he was there. Yes. We condemn what he did was wrong. But we said the way the police was treating him was also was wrong. also wrong. We spoke up. Absolutely. So it is this same journalist that will speak up for you, that will help mold public opinion. Mm -hmm. I think in the best interest of himself and the family and the ordeal they have gone through, he should pipe blue on this Absolutely. for now. Absolutely. Face his musical career, face his concerts and face his tours. All right. he you also, don't want to be in the middle of all of this. He also talked, it was another case of domestic violence, exactly, right? Exactly, that's what and, I was And his wife and all of that. Yeah. He should be careful. Address, because he also, you know, touched on I, that I, as I well, thought. because people were talking about the fact that he's also violent at home, and he, you know, discredited that. So you saw the video, you'd see the point where his wife was trying to calm him down, yes. and then he shouted at her, and she went back, you know, almost the, scurry. Yes. Um, um, that's the video where he slapped the, he police, slapped officer, the police officer. Correct. Now, um, one of the things he said, I, I quite, it sounded like a good thing, where he said, oh, instead, I'm not afraid of my, she's not afraid of me, instead, I'm the one who's scared of my wife. Mm. But then he goes on to say that the men are jealous because he can talk to his wife and she will listen, his wife obeys him. Other Nigerian men are jealous, and I thought to myself that, again, I want to read the Miranda's Act to Sheon, even though I'm not police officer you have the right to remain silent everything you say can and will be used against you because you're definitely yeah. under the microscope by many nigerians i think he should have even even as a way of just for optics apologize for the way he came across the way he shouted at his wife that he, that's verbal abuse you don't Absolutely. have to hit a woman to be abusive so you could have just said oh, i was i was really upset i was angry and anyone can get angry you don't you know i don't think he, he made her come out in the best of lights that's yet his right. wife all right then We'll take our final story. President Bola Ahmed Tinubu on Thursday released a new video on Instagram capturing snippets of his inauguration on May 29th at the Eagle Square in Abuja with the caption, Welcome to the era of renewed hope. Let's take a look. I stand before you, honored to have seen Mr. Kerr and you. My love for this nation. That I think, that confidence in this dream of 
Federal Republic of Nigeria. So help me go. I guess we're going to hold him up to those um, <laughs> oaths that he shared in that video. Jagaban. Well, that's all I have for you guys on what's trending today. I'll see you all next week. <laughs>